Hello. Welcome to Cultivating Conditions for Serendipity. What Google Calendar and 100 interviews with game developers taught me about curating my time. My name is Javiera Cordera and my pronouns are she, her. So I've got a full bio here, but I think the only important things to know about me from having me here and speak to you are that I care most about helping people who make games and helping people who want to make games get into games. And so I'm really grateful to be here and to have this opportunity to chat with you and share some of my story and some of the things that I've learned over the last year. But first, I want to talk about trans identity because it's important and it's still a problem for some people. You should listen to us. We have so many things of value to say and our experiences matter and they are all unique and so varied. You should hire us. What that also means is when we apply to jobs, interview us. Even if we don't fit your requirements, use equitable hiring practices and at least allow us to interview, allow us to grow. Promote us when we are working at your companies. Our ideas are also valuable and we are worthy of growth and recognition. And most importantly, show up. When there's anti-trans legislation in play, show up and please vote against it because we matter as humans. There's an incredible talk by this trans activist, poet and artist named Alok. I super encourage everyone who's watching this to please go and watch this and share this with your friends. Trans acceptance is not a trans problem, it is a cisgender problem. So please, cisgender folks, allies, please educate yourself on why compassion is more important than comprehension. Back to the talk. So a little bit story of me and how I got into games. I have been games adjacent for about eight years. That's a long time. I suffered from a lack of direction of not knowing where I personally fit in the game industry. Me not being an artist, I didn't know how to make music. I wasn't particularly interested in making and designing my own games. And so I had no idea about where I fit in. I lacked community. The people in my immediate vicinity were not game developers. I had never met a game developer. And throughout the eight years that I was games adjacent, that was because I was volunteering at game events. And then when I would come back home from those game events, I would just have my immediate community and they weren't in games. I didn't really know or have any sense of where to start or who to talk to. But the most critical thing that I lacked was proper financial support so that I could actually sit down and focus on the task of educating myself of how to navigate the hiring section of the games industry. It is heavily skewed towards people who have had the opportunity to go to college, who have had the opportunity to be a part of certain programs that are based on a like selection basis. I never had any of those opportunities. And I was stuck in jobs where I didn't like them, but I could do them. And as someone who had been living on my own since I was 16, I was a chef for 10 years. Um, I worked various other jobs, but I was often in a state of survival where I couldn't have the bandwidth to chase or to do any of this research. And I also went through long periods of unemployment where I would get laid off from a, a restaurant job and it would be so emotionally damaging that I would take some months to try to recuperate from it and build up the will to look for another job again. I would speak to some friends who mentioned some entry level game industry job. I would apply and never hear back. So essentially eight years of being games adjacent, eight years of hitting walls, eight years of not knowing where to start. What changed? Why is that? How did I go from there to here. The last half of 2020, 
I had been unemployed. I had left my job to uh, work on organizing in the Seattle area. And for five months, I struggled to get back into the workforce. Uh, previous to that, I was managing four restaurants. <clears throat> and in January, I hit a crisis point. At the end of that crisis point, I woke up the next day and I thought to myself, okay, well, I don't know where to go from here, but yesterday was almost a, uh, there is no more from here. So I thought, well, I guess after having come this close to have lost everything, I guess I'll come out to the place where I was most afraid of. And I came out on Twitter. When I came out on Twitter, the thread went viral and <laughs> it's hard for me to adequately communicate the, uh, the emotions that were going through my mind when I came out on Twitter, but it was significant. It was fear and hope and despair and having people who I had known for years unfollow me and having people who I had known for years DM me with messages of support. Twitter had always been my primary community. Um, that was where I had spent years, eight years, building community, friends, networking with game developers, and just indulging my passion for game development, indulging my passion for story. This community was the scariest to come out to because I knew that if I came out on Twitter, and was rejected thoroughly, I wouldn't know where else to go. Earlier that year in January was when I had come to the realization myself that I was a trans woman and I had come out to a few close friends, but beyond some people in my initial physical community in Seattle, I was still in the closet. I didn't even know that trans lesbian women were a thing. Um, and through the course of this thread, I, through the course of this past year, I found language to describe what my lived experience had always been. I asked for help, guidance, um, anything that could help me actually find a job that I was really interested in. And help came. People showed up. In my DMs, uh, people showed up in text, in email. I received over the course of two days around 500 private messages. And I met other trans women and heard about their experience. And a ton of people really wanted to help. And all of a sudden, I was thrust into this problem of how do I organize myself and how do I control or cultivate this influx of new people, new information? How do I present my questions in a way that is meaningful and impactful? From January to April, I spoke with over 100 game developers. Most of them were producers. Some of them were studio owners. Some of them were just friends. But in the course of speaking to over 100 game developers, I learned a lot of things. I also applied to Code Coven and similar programs that offered uh, incubator programs for people who had never been into games to learn how to get into games. I also got rejected. I wasn't selected for their lottery system of getting support. I wasn't that lucky brown person. I wasn't the lucky queer person who got selected and all of a sudden was given support and all of a sudden mattered but I'm also really good at surviving systems that are not designed for me. I built up a team of mentors, specifically in game production, and the kinds of questions that I asked in the beginning to like the first 10 developers I spoke with evolved significantly from speaking to the other 100. Fast forward to May, and I got hired. I got my first game industry job. I work at Beamable. They are a Unity backend suite tools developer. I am paid full-time 
salary, not contract, permanently remote, and they pay me great. They pay me more than I have ever made in my entire life. They pay me more than anyone in my family has ever made. I also work as an associate producer part-time contract for Threshold Games, a trans-led XAAA studio, and we're building a solar punk 4X game. This talk was about what did I learn during that process? How did I organize myself? And hopefully there's something that you're gonna gain from the process. What we're gonna cover is identifying needs in your job search, creating visibility into your needs, how to ask for help, text replacement, organizational tools, and calendar magic required to manage it all. Let's talk about goals of this talk. I hope that people can learn from my mistakes. I hope that it doesn't take any other person on earth eight years to figure out how to get in the game industry. I want people to be armed with actual techniques and systematic thinking and processes that turn a 30 second action into a two second action and something that turns a five minute conversation into a one minute conversation. And I also want to help people understand how life changing and amazing it is to, for the first time in my 33 years of life, feel like I have a real awareness of everything that is going on in my life, when it needs to happen, who needs to help me do it. Another goal of this talk is also that through the course of this talk, people like me, people who are from diverse backgrounds, people who are not white cisgender men are able to get into games as well. I want more women, gender non-conforming and folks of diverse, diverse cultural and ethnic backgrounds in games. I'm not asking for a lot. All I'm asking for is that this over preponderance of support that is going to white cisgender men to spread it out a little. Diverse teams tell better stories. Diverse teams are safer for business operations. More cultural checks and balances so that debacles like CD Projekt Red's marketing fiasco with the trans woman on the vending machine or Blizzard Activision's history of abuse don't foment. Blizzard Activision is still a thing. Keep talking about it. It is not solved yet. It won't be solved by a settlement in court either. Let's go over general principles. People want to help. People are disorganized. Being organized communicates respect. Assumptions of this talk. You want a job in the game industry. I'm assuming that the audience here is coming because they are looking to better understand how to organize themselves in that effort. And then I'm also assuming that you understand that you can't do that alone and that you do need the help of friends and peers of people who have the job that you want. This is also an assumption that you would be, you would derive a lot of value from getting feedback on your portfolio, your resume, applications to jobs, interviewing, what kinds of questions are asked in interviews for the role that you're looking for, as well as other resources to help you in your profession of books, talks, resources, and that you would also benefit from a wider network and community. How to get a job in the game industry, talk by Javier Cordero. Be lucky. No, really, be lucky. There isn't one way to get in the game industry and do not stop at listening to the advice of a single person or 10 people or 20 people about how to get there. So much of advice is entirely autobiographical and does not apply to other people. What worked for me and the story of how I got into games was a specific aligning of stars that only really applies to me. So. From this talk, 
I hope that there are techniques that you can apply to you and apply with your own wisdom. I believe luck is a stat that can be cultivated. It can be cultivated by building your community of peers, identifying in your bank of knowledge about the field that you are trying to join, what are your gaps? What are the things that you do not know? What are the things that you do not know that you do not know? Your known unknowns and your unknown unknowns, those can be approached through community, through people who have the job that you want. Getting feedback from people who have the job that you want is critical. I do truly not believe that there is any way I would be here as someone working in the video game industry in production, working at another job as an associate producer, if I hadn't spoken to so many producers and gotten a real strong sense of what producers do on a given day. From January to April, after speaking to those 100 game developers, I must have applied to over like 30 jobs and I didn't get a single interview. And then Gene Leggett helped me revamp my resume. And the first job I applied to with the resume, I got an interview. And the first interview I got, I got the job. And a lot of the awareness and knowledge and confidence that I held in that interview was directly responsible from speaking to people who had the job that I wanted. Ask better questions. A lot of questions about how to get in the games are very surface level because that person hasn't done the requisite research about what is being asked of the role that they say that they want. And very importantly, making it easy for people to help you is so critical. Oftentimes, if you just say help, some people will keep walking by. They won't know what you actually need. So you being clear on what you need and what will be impactful to you is also critical. So how do you do that? How do you do that in a way that feels good? For me, it's being organized. Let's get organized, babes. Let's talk about tools. So the first key tool is that you have to get what you need and who you are and what you have done onto a single document. And that has to be a single link that when you have that link, you can give it to someone and say, hey, this is everything that you need to know about me and what I'm looking for. In that Google Doc, there's a link to your resume, cover letter, an intro paragraph introducing you as a person, what you care about, what you're passionate about, what motivates you, and then what you are looking for and a way for them to get in touch with you. The other critical tool is a single sheet. I have a single sheet that essentially tracks this massive project that I'm working on and I estimate we'll probably be working on for the next couple of years. But in this sheet for you, the minimum things that I would recommend for tabs in this sheet are a roster of people with links to their social accounts, who they are, context about how they can help you, another sheet for job engines. What are all the job engines you are looking at? Be asking those questions to people that you meet so that you can continue to build that list and continue to build your awareness of where jobs are being posted. Another tab of game dev communities. So many job opportunities are found by interfacing directly with game dev communities on Discord, on Facebook, in forums, on Reddit. Um, it's impossible to predict where your job opportunity might come from, but outlining those communities and detailing where they are and how to get a hold of them is going to help you along your way. Another page for a roster of jobs you're interested in, links to their job descriptions. What I also do is I take a screenshot of that job description because they often get pulled down and I put that in Google Drive as well. Anything else that you might need to record? I have just another page that is just simple drafting notes. If someone mentions a talk and I don't have time to think about where to put it, I just drop it in the sheet. Let's talk about my secret weapon, text replacement. Text shortcuts 
are transformative. I cannot express this enough. No, really, I'm serious. About Windows, there are third-party software that you can find to do text replacement. But speaking just from my experience and for this talk, um, I have an iMac, I have an iPhone, and on iOS, there is a place for you to add text shortcuts. You copy and paste a large body of text into a phrase, and then you have another section that is the short text that you're going to type to trigger that auto replacement. I use this for everything, for portfolio links, social links, Google Drive links to resume and cover letters, Zoom invite links, email addresses, job boards, spreadsheets for mentors. This is what it looks like when you're not using text replacement and you're gonna type out a message, right? If you're looking for a job, how many times in a given week might you type this sentence out? That's taking you like 30 seconds. It might take you a minute depending on your message. But when you are looking for something or trying to communicate something, if you are doing it more than twice or three times, give it a shortcut. This is what it looks like with shortcuts. I type in feedback, please, and it truncates it with a sentence. RESU drops the link to my resume. I use this in my work all the time as a producer. If there is an invite link to a specific JIRA board, if there's a link to tickets, the prefix um, that is before every single JIRA ticket, I have that URL as a text shortcut. So whenever I'm hyperlinking texts to uh, JIRA tickets in meeting notes, text replacement. If my entire talk, if I just spent 40 minutes telling everyone watching this to use text replacement, it will change your life. That would give me value enough. Please, please, please try it out. It's amazing. It's also great for menial things like terminology, names, uh, accented words or letters, um, or things that autocorrect won't catch. So if there is a friend of mine and they have an accent in their name that's not normally going to show up on an English keyboard. I'll use that as a text replacement. If there is the name of a company that is referenced a lot in meeting notes, that gets a text replacement. Next, I wanna talk about Zoom. So Zoom gives you invite links. It's, everyone's got it basically. It's super accessible. You can screen share and actually show and demo and it, you can record. So sometimes when I'm in Zoom calls, I'm gonna record the call so I can review it later. And then actually just download the full SDK. I know a lot of people don't have it installed and in an era of COVID and remote working, just down, just download it. The other most incredible tool that I use on a day-to-day -day basis is Otter. Otter is a live transcription service. It is insanely accurate. You can also interact with the text as it's being written. And it's accessible. The, I want more companies to use this as a standard in all meetings. Um, if I am in a meeting with a person where English is not their native language, having like live text uh, transcription is incredible and transformative. And you can also go back in that transcript and reference specific pieces of the audio. You can highlight it, you can drop in pictures. Um, it's amazing. Please try it out. And then Toggle. I use Toggle to track how long it takes me to do a given thing. So if I'm applying to a job, I'm going to put it on because I want to know if I'm going to apply to 30 jobs, I hope that in the 30th job, I am faster at applying to the 30th job than I was at the first 10 jobs. This helps you get a better sense of how long something is going to take. If you have X amount of hours in a given evening and you know that you wanna get something done, having some data about how long it took you to do that in the past is going to better, help you better make decisions. And then just get the Chrome extensions for each of these tools. Getting the Zoom extension allows you to just press a button within Chrome 
and launch a, launch a Zoom call. Uh, the Otter extension is incredible because it syncs up to Google Calendar and you can just preload a link to that transcription that will be for that meeting note. And then with Toggle, you can just track, uh, you can start and stop timers for things that you are doing directly in Google Calendar. Be a busy bee. I don't know why I put that in there. <clears throat> That's me. Let's talk about Google Calendar. That's why we're all here. First, I want to go over some general design theory. I see Google Calendar as the full source of all truth, where my attention should be, what I have to do, when I have to do it, what I need to do that thing. All of that information lives in Google Calendar. I look at Google Calendar constantly. It is a tab that's always open. It is the place that I can just at a glance know what I have to do that day, whether I'm gonna be free or not. And it helps offload all of those things out of my short-term memory somewhere else so that I can be more present, so that I can have better recall memory for the things that won't fit in Google Calendar. <clears throat> Using Google Calendar takes time. Uh, it's a new habit. And when you are building new habits, new habits take time and consistency and repetition more you put into it, the more value it will bring you. If you are just using Google Calendar for like a handful of things, or you're using it for maybe two thirds of the things that you do in your given day, that, that's gonna give you a lot less value than you're gonna get if you actually use it for every single thing that you have to do. It costs you time after you wake up to stretch or do any of your morning routines or eat breakfast. So I have that time budgeted out on my Google Calendar. The first thing to do when setting a Google Calendar, because at least for me, pre-January, my Google Calendar was just empty. I had a few one-off event invitations, but I was never someone who had ever really spent time using a planner or a calendar of any kind. So my calendar was completely blank. One of my first techniques that I do with Google Calendar is I log everything I do. And I know that I have to sleep every day. So that gets budgeted into a calendar. I set up a recurring event because I know that I'm going to sleep every day. And that's going to cost me time. So I budget time out for that. You can set them to reoccurring if you need to move it. but even just having a general idea that there will be that thing that is looming in the near future to do, it's on the calendar. When you log your obligations, it gets a lot easier to sort of understand what you have to play with. If I am just amorphously thinking, oh, I'll sleep whenever, and then someone asks me when I'm available, I might think, oh yeah, sure, I'm available at 10 p.m. I'm available at 11 p.m. But essentially being overestimating how little time I have will grant me more time because I will be more conservative with where I'm spending it and what I'm promising out. Other existing commitments that go on the calendar are your work schedules. So if you work and maybe that work does not involve tech or calendars of any kind. It still goes on a calendar. It is, it is a place where your attention and time is needed, where your presence is needed, and you cannot do anything else. So throw it on a calendar. Once more, we are going for a realistic projection of when you are available by. Now, I account for time mundane things, like I mentioned before, about breakfast or stretching. Um, some of us have things that we do every week. We might play a D&D game with a group of friends at the same time every week. But any commitment I have anywhere, no matter if it's one time or recurring, it's going to go on a calendar. Some things that I do with the calendar as well is I go into settings and make some adjustments. I throw out dual time zones. This is going to be super helpful. Once again, this talk is predicated on the idea that you will be speaking to hundreds 
of people who can help you get your job in the game industry. And so you being proactive about knowing time conversions and not have not asking or expecting any, anyone else to do that work is going to speed those inter interactions along. So settings, time zone, set up dual time zones, and I would just use the two most frequented time zones. Then with world clocks, I'm working more than just two time zones. I might be interested in speaking with game developers in Australia or in China or India or like France, right? They are operating in all these different time zones and there's no need for me to spend the time to Google and then try to make sure I've got the right time code. You can embed all of this in Google Calendar. So you'll see it open it up the, on the side there. And this is living. So whenever you click on the calendar and you choose a different invite, as you adjust the time, that calendar will also adjust. So it's a really clean UI. It's very easy to use. Um, it's something that I absolutely recommend. This makes it easy, essentially, for other people to give their availability. What you are looking for is to respect someone's time and make it so easy for them to help you. Sometimes people will be like, when are you free? That is a very general question. I would have, then I might respond, oh, uh, I'm on this, what time zone are you on? And it, it grows that like 10 minute conversation of figuring out when the two of you are gonna be free, it grows it into something large. So when you are proactive in assuming that another person may not be in the same, same time zone as you, and that assuming that time conversion is annoying and tricky and they probably don't have the same setup as you, predicting that and then just approaching them. And this is essentially the, the, the block template text that I send to people whenever I'm trying to schedule a meeting with anyone for anything. It's like, hey, from you, just give me a range of hours and a day in your time zone. And so that allows the person to just think for themselves in their native time zone and figure out what's worked for them. They can suggest the time to you and then you can, you can do that work. Once again, the goal is making it accessible for people to help you. When you do that, you also get their email to add them to the calendar invite. This helps with rescheduling, with pre-planning, because their email being in the calendar invite means that that invite is going to show up on their account as well. And so that's a way for you to book the meeting. And then later, if you have other questions or material to add before the meeting, you can add it to the agenda. And then it also makes repeat conversations very easy so that um, you can just click on the, the old calendar invite, make a new one. It pre-populates it with the email. Let's talk about agendas. Why use an agenda? <laughs> it makes you more confident. It makes you more organized. And it demonstrates that you respect another person's time. It can turn a... 30 minute conversation that might be meandering and maybe 40% maybe of that conversation is figuring out what you want to talk about to instead being very targeted, very focused and very productive. What goes in an agenda? Everything that you need for the talk. This is sort of the base template for what I put in agendas. Um, the primary piece of the agenda, the agenda, is going to be essentially everything you want to talk about in specific great detail. If I'm going to speak to another producer um, and I know that I'm going to speak with them, if I don't have an agenda, you're going to waste about five minutes, 10 minutes of that meeting figuring out what it is you want to talk about. And in that time, that person also is going to be wondering, what are we going to talk about? Am I going to be prepared? By asking targeted questions, you allow that person to come to the meeting first with everything that they need to answer your questions and with clear asks. And there's a second, then, then there's a section in the agenda that I always put of reference. This is so important. Anything that I'm going to deal with or show or demo or reference goes in this section. There's a link to the Zoom call. There is a link to the Twitter 
uh, conversation. Whenever you open a DM with someone on Twitter, it custom it creates a custom URL. So I use that URL to bounce directly from Google Calendar back to the conversation at hand. And it's been so useful in the past. Sometimes I will book a meeting for like two months from now. And when I finally walk in that meeting, I'm like, oh shit, why did I set this up? What were we gonna talk about? But I'm able to just use this link to bounce back and forth. And it's also helpful for people who are also being booked for you. And there's a link to a single Google Doc that has all your information, how to get a hold of you, and then a link that's just to a blank Google Sheet shared with just you and the person you're meeting that is essentially a drafting table. It's bringing the utility of if you were to actually meet someone in person and then you have a notebook that you are both writing in, so useful. But I throw all of this in, an, in the agenda. And then backlinking was that aspect of putting the URL in there. In terms of when you make this agenda, I do these ahead of time. If I know that I'm going to be speaking with a game designer in Texas and I haven't heard back from them about like if they can meet me or when they can meet me or even do they want to meet me, I know that I want to talk to them. So I just essentially create a calendar invite, don't invite anyone, put all the information in it. And then the moment that person confirms a time, all I have to do is add their email address to the calendar invite and it's all ready to go. Time blocking. Um, so this is something that I have not been good at until very just recently in this like past few months where when you book time to speak with someone who's gonna help you find a job or it's gonna give you feedback, they will likely reference material that you would need to check out. They might reference another person you can speak with and you're still gonna need time throughout your day to actually do that work so if I'm having a one hour call with someone, I'm often booking an hour or two hours after that for follow-up work. And then with advanced booking, at the end of every call, I schedule a follow-up. This is something that I can keep the conversation going and it could be for any point in the future. And most people will say yes. If you speak with me and you're asking me for feedback on your resume, you will likely want to get feedback from me when you put updates on your resume. So if you're looking for a job and I'm helping you, then at the end of our call, you can say, hey, could I schedule a follow-up call with you in a month, in two months, three months? And then you just go to the calendar, you go to options and you hit duplicate. It grabs all of the information from the previous invite with their email address, everything that was in that, and it pre-populates it into the agenda, and then you can click on it and make some last minute customizations. And then with rescheduling, what I like to do is if I'm not going to make an event, then I decline it so it stays on my actual calendar and I duplicate it. So what this does is it gives multiple avenues to let the other person know that you're not gonna be there. It also keeps that historical data that you were going to do this thing at a given time. In terms of canceling, what's nice about Google Calendar of just having their emails in there and having a full dashboard of everything you're going to do is that there is a button to just directly email all attendees. So if I have a call with two game developers that I'm meeting with, I could message them one by one. Um, I could go into my emails and try to find the email chain, or I can just actually click on the calendar invite, click the email button and email them directly from there. It already populates the subject line. Um, and so just the RSV, the RSV feature, using the RSVP feature, um, to email is great. And then it, whenever I'm closing out of a meeting, I immediately follow up. I send a thank you. This is a great way to sort of bookend that interaction and have it in writing of like, we did a thing. Thank you so much for it. And also I'm looking forward to speaking with you on whatever date that you set the recurring uh, other invitation for. 
I'm probably late to send this, so I should do that. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, I just wanted to take a moment to thank a lot of people. Um, I don't have time to list the hundreds and hundreds of people that have helped me, but the primary person that I would love to thank is Yesenia Cisneros, who's a producer at Brassline. She helped me essentially attend my first Scrum class and gave me that extra layer of external validation that I was worthwhile and that I could do it and that I should pursue production. I wanna thank every job that rejected me. I wanna thank every job that told me, you're not the right fit. I also wanna thank Liam and Sav for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, it's been a super pleasure and I look forward to answering any questions that come from this. Uh, here's my, my Twitter and my email. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, please, uh, my DMs are open. Thanks so much, and I hope you all have a great day. Bye.